<laughs> oh, hello. I didn't see you there. I'm currently 30,000 feet above the ground, but I figured I'd take a little bit of my time to talk with you all about structural equation modeling and dyadic data collection. And so I've entitled my presentation, Double Jeopardy, a reworking of Tyson Solomon's relational turbulence model of irritations. So before we get into the actual ins and outs of the way that I would like to take this study and turn it into a dyadic collection, we should probably talk about the original study first just to give ourselves a little bit of background in terms of what exactly uh, the authors were interested in measuring. And so the paper is entitled, A Relational Turbulence Model of Communication about Irritations in Romantic Relationships. It was written by uh, Dr. Jennifer A. Tice and Dr. Denise Solomon. <clears throat> who are two of the uh, primary authors when it comes to the relational turbulence model. And so the original study had a number of key variables of interest. Uh, primarily their dependent variable in this study was the directness of communication about relational irritations. And so what we mean when we say that is it's the communication that we're having about the irritations regarding our relationship. Right? So things that get in the way of our relationship is what we're trying to see how people communicate and if they communicate it directly or indirectly. And so for the purposes of this presentation, their primary independent variables were first intimacy, which of course uh, deals with things like relational closeness and loving and caring and nurturing and things like that. And they also dealt with self, partner, and relationship uncertainty. And now for those of you who are unfamiliar with the three terms, self uncertainty regards uh, the way that I feel about my role in, in a given relationship. Am I committed? Do I love my partner? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, partner uncertainty is just the opposite of that. It's how I believe my partner feels. How committed are they? Uh, do they love me? Are they um, going to be loyal towards me? And finally, relationship uncertainty uh, is the uncertainty we have about the relationship as a unit, as a whole, uh, rather than just about uh, one of the members. And so this is key for dyadic data collection, right? Because we're dealing with self and partner and relationship. Uh, and so it's really a win-win here. Uh, but more about that later. Interference was also an important uh, variable in this study. Interference referring to the amount that um, my partner interferes with my everyday goals. So how much does the partner interfere with the actor's everyday goals? The final independent variable of interest was the perceived negativity of irritations. And so how negative did people think uh, these irritations were? Uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, just a little bit of background information about uh, the methodology of the study. Uh, it was actually collected over a six-week longitudinal period, uh, which for those of you who have done longitudinal studies uh, is very uh, daunting uh, and, and very impressive. Um, and so the end ranged from 215 participants week one all the way down to 106, so roughly half after the six week of completion. And uh, if you go and open up the actual article, uh, you'll see that uh, the end decreases gradually from week to week. And so the primary methodology that was being used in this study was hierarchical linear, linear modeling and, uh, of course, structural equation modeling. And what they did is they tested both longitudinal and cross-sectional results. Cross-sectional probably because they had a little bit more statistical power, and, of course, longitudinal because a six-week period can tell you a great deal about um, the directness in which uh, people are communicating. <clears throat> And so rather than bore you by showing you a list of hypotheses, I'll tell you that there were six uh, hypotheses and that four of six of them uh, were supported. Uh, now, it'll make a lot more sense uh, once we get to the next slide in which the actual model is presented. Uh, and so if you would journey with me on now to uh, the, uh, the model, uh, the predicted model, and uh, as we take a look at this here, what we see are a number of green circles and red circles. And I've just done that um, in order to uh, illustrate to you which of the hypotheses were supported and which of the hypotheses uh, were not supported. <clears throat> so uh, we see that intimacy is positively related to communicative directness. Uh, we see that self-uncertainty is positively related to communicative directness. Uh, and finally, we see that relationship uncertainty is negatively related to communication directness. And remember, this is the directness of communication about relational irritations. The final supported hypothesis is that the perceived negativity of interactions was positively uh, related to this communicative directness. Now, we see a number of uh, red circles on the graph, and those represent uh, 
the two unsupported hypotheses, right? And so the first uh, red circle deals with the relationship between partner uncertainty and relationship uncertainty. And it was said that relationship uncertainty was going to mediate the interaction between partner uncertainty and communicative directness, meaning that there would be a positive relationship between partner uncertainty and relationship uncertainty. And that was not found in this study, which is really interesting, but we'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, the other mediating factor here is that uh, the interference of a partner would mediate the relationship between intimacy and the perceived negativity of an interaction, right? And so we see uh, a negative relationship between intimacy and interference. We see a positive uh, relationship between interference and perceived negativity of interactions. And as you can see, both of those were found to not, uh, not be in existence. Uh, and although there are seven circles, there were six hypotheses. These final two red ones just represent uh, the relationship between intimacy and perceived negativity of interaction. So we see our model here. Uh, we see what's been supported and what has not been supported. And because of that, as we get to the dyadic reworking of this model, uh, there's a few things I want to do. And the first thing I want to do is I want to maintain that structural equational dyadic framework um, that we went over yesterday. Uh, I think this whole uh, testing the goodness of fit works in this particular uh, dyadic collection. And so I'd like to keep that. Uh, one thing I'd like to do, um, if you'll journey with me back now to the previous slide, is I'd like to create a latent variable of relational uncertainty using self, partner, and relationship uncertainty as manifest variables. So we measure them, culminate them together, and load them onto um, relational uncertainty. And so we have this nice pretty little um, latent variable. Uh, and finally, I'd like to remove interference from this model, right? I think the major implication from this model is that what we see is that interference does not necessarily an irritation make. And what I mean by that is that every time your partner interferes with your everyday goals, uh, it, it's not necessarily going to lead to an irritation. It could just be a passing by thing that we don't, um, you know, weight too heavily. And so that's an important distinction to make. And so I'd like to get rid of it because it's going to clutter up our model. Uh, and importantly, it, it wasn't found uh, to be supportive. And so I think relational uncertainty is the main thing to stick with in this particular model. Okay. Um, real quickly, I'd like to do a cross-sectional design, not longitudinal. I think that would be way too much to ask of dyads. Um, I'm going to predict actor-actor, partner-partner, and actor-partner predictions uh, across a series of four two-part hypotheses. Two-part because they're dyadic. Um, and then finally, I'm going to present one research question that um, addresses levels of intradyadic communicative directness. <clears throat> and that sounds a little strange, but um, if you'll journey with me now to the uh, final slide of my presentation, you'll see a whole bunch of uh, variables and a whole bunch of arrows, and I'll just walk you through those real quickly. Uh, what we see here is hypothesis 1A and B, uh, in that self-relational uncertainty will relate uh, negatively with communicative directness, as will partner relational uncertainty with partner communicative directness. And so those are the only negative relationships that we're posing here, right? And so the second um, set of hypotheses that we're dealing here is that uh, self-negativity, uh, rather, pardon me, self-intimacy uh, level, so the amount of intimacy that I'm experiencing, is going to be positively related to communicative directness. And I'm also proposing that it's going to be positively related to the partner's communicative directness. And the, the thought process behind that is that if I'm intimate with my partner, I might communicate with them directly, which might uh, cause them to communicate with me directly. So that's what we have in our uh, second proposed set of hypotheses. Now, the third proposed set of hypotheses is just a mirror image of, of those second hypotheses in that we're dealing with partner intimacy and self-communicative directness, and then partner intimacy with um, partner communicative directness. So. Um, as you can see, we have actor-partner, and then we have partner-actor effects. And then finally, uh, what we're dealing with is the self-negativity of irritations, perceived negativity of irritations, being positively related to communicative directness, uh, which we saw in the original model uh, as well. And so uh, that should be fine. Uh, we're going to see it from the partner's perspective as well. And now, originally, I was going to um, suggest a relationship between perceived negativity of irritation for the self and partner uh, directiveness. I chose not to do that because it's a, a very perceptual um, complexity. And because of that, it doesn't seem as though it could affect partner uh, communicative directness um, in any way more than chance. And so the final question that I have here um, is highlighted with the blue arrow. And what I'm asking here is, is self-communication uh, directiveness 
related in any way to partner communicative directiveness? And I feel that's an important question because uh, we're dealing with the primary communication variable of this study. And so finding that out could better help us understand the ways in which couples communicate and it could help us to make better sense of all the previous predictions that I've made in this particular study. So uh, that's where I'm sitting at right now in terms of my thought process and what's going on here uh, with me. Uh, hopefully um, somebody caught something I did wrong and could suggest some feedback for me as I write my paper. Um, I won't write the whole thing on the plane so that I can take feedback into account. Uh, but yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And um, I just want to say thanks to everyone. Thanks to Laura. It was a great class. Learned a whole bunch. So thanks so much. See you guys in August.